Time is a very difficult thing to pin down. There's a famous saying of St. Augustine of Hippo that when he was asked, what is time? He said, I know what it is, but when you ask me, I don't. And yet it seems absolutely fundamental to our life. Time is money, we say. I don't have enough time. Time flies. Time drags. And I think we should go into the question of what this is because in our ordinary common sense we think of time as a one-way motion from the past, through the present, and on into the future. And that carries along with it another impression which is to say that life moves from the past to the future in such a way that what happens now and what will happen is always the result of what has happened in the past. In other words, we seem to be driven along. You know, once upon a time it was fashionable in psychology for people to speak of man's and animal's instincts. That we have, for example, an instinct for survival an instinct to make love, and so on. But nowadays that word has become unfashionable and psychologists tend instead to use the word drives and to speak of the need for food as a drive, the need for survival or for sex as drives. And that's a very significant word because it's brought out, isn't it, by people who feel driven. I must say, personally, if I feel hungry, I don't feel driven. Also, if I feel lusty, I don't feel driven. Because I don't say, oh, excuse me, but I have to eat. Or excuse me, but I need to fulfill my sexual urges, my biological impulses. I say, hooray, I identify myself with my drives. They are me and I don't take a passive attitude towards them and apologize for them. So the whole idea of our being driven is connected with the idea of causality, of life moving under the power of the past. And that is so ingrained in our common sense that it's very difficult to get rid of it because I want to turn the thing round completely the other way and say that the past is the result of the present. Let us suppose, just for the sake of example, that this universe started with a big bang, as some cosmologists believe. Now, when that bang happened, it was the present, wasn't it? And so the, the universe began in what we will call a now moment. Then it goes on doing its stuff. And always, when any event that we now call past came into being, it came into being in the present and out of the present. That's one way of seeing. But before we get further involved in this, I want to draw your attention to a fallacy in the very common sense idea of causality. That events are caused by previous events from which they flow or result necessarily. To understand the fallacy of that idea, we have to begin by asking, what do you mean by an event? Let's take the event of a human being coming into the world. Now, when does that event begin? Does it occur at the moment of parturition, when the baby actually comes out of its mother? Or does the baby begin at the moment of conception? Or does the baby begin when it was an evil gleam in its father's eye? Or does a baby begin when uh, the spermatozoa 
are generated in the father or the ovum in the mother. Or could you say a baby begins when its father is born or when its mother is born? All these things can be thought of as beginnings. But we decide for purposes of legal registration that a life begins at the moment of parturition. And that is a purely arbitrary decision. And it has validity only because we all agree about it. Let me show you the same phenomenon in the dimension of space instead of the dimension of time. Let's ask, how big is the sun? Are we going to define the sun as limited by the extent of its fire? That's one possible definition. But we could equally well define the sphere of the sun by the extent of its heat. We could also define the sphere of the sun by the extent of its light. And each of these would be reasonable choices, except that it's rather difficult to keep track of the extent of its light because we're inside it. And therefore we have arbitrarily agreed to define the sun by the limit of its visible fire. But you will see in all these, by, by, by these analogies, that how big a thing is or how long an event is, is simply a matter of definition. Now therefore, when by simple definition for purposes of discussion, we have divided events into certain periods, we'll say the First World War began in 1914 and it ended in 1918. Now actually, all those things which led up to the First World War started long before 1914. And the repercussions of that war have continued long beyond 1918. How are we to distinguish an event from its repercussions? So you will see that because we have divided events from one another in this arbitrary way, we do that and then we sort of forget we did it. And then we have a puzzle. How do events lead to each other? Because you see, in reality, there are no separate events. Life moves along like water. And it's all connected as the source of a river is connected to the mouth and to the ocean. And all the events or things going on are like whirlpools in the stream. Because you go there today and you see a whirlpool. You go there tomorrow and you see a whirlpool. But it isn't the same whirlpool because all the water is changing every second. What is happening is not really what we should call a whirlpool, but rather a whirlpooling. It is an activity, not a thing. And indeed, every so-called thing can be called an event. We call, say, a house, housing. We call a mat, matting. And we could equally call a cat a catting. So we could say the catting sat on the matting. And we would thereby have a world in which there were no things but only events. To give another illustration, a flame is something we say there is a flame on the candle. But it would be more correct to say there is a flaming on the candle because the flame is a stream of hot gas. Let's take another amusing example. We say fist. And fist is a noun. And fist looks like a thing, but suddenly what happens to the fist when I open my hand? See, I was fisting. Now I'm handing. Handing it to you. So every kind of so-called thing can be spoken of as an event. And because events flow into each other, the fisting flows into the handing. We cannot say exactly where one ends and the other begins. So therefore, if we remember that, we shall see that we do not need the idea of causality to explain how a prior event influences a following event, because it's like this. Supposing I'm looking through a narrow slit in a fence and a snake goes by 
I've never seen a snake before, and this is mysterious. And I see through the slit in the fence, first the snake's head. Then I see a long trailing body, and then finally the tail. I said, well, that was interesting. Then the snake turns round and goes back. And again, I see first the head, and then after an interval, the tail. Now, if I call the head one event and the tail another, it will seem to me that the event head is the cause of the event tail. And the tail is the effect. But if I look at the whole snake, I will see a head-tailed snake, and it would be simply absurd to say that the head of the snake is the cause of the tail, as if the head came in, as if the snake came into being, first the head and then the tail. The snake comes into being out of its egg as a head-tailed snake. And so in exactly the same way, all events are really one event. We're looking, when we talk about different events, we're looking at different sections or parts of one continuous happening. And therefore, the idea of separate events, which have to be linked by a mysterious process called cause and effect, is completely unnecessary. But having thought that way, we think of present events as being caused by past events and therefore we tend to regard ourselves as the puppets of the past as driven along by something that is always behind us now to overcome this impression it's very simple you begin again with an experiment which i suggested in a previous talk about meditation. Approach the world through your ears. If you shut your eyes and make contact with reality, purely with your ears, I mean, it's kind of silly perhaps to shut your eyes when you're looking at television, but do it just for a moment. And you will realize that the sounds you are hearing are all coming out of silence. You hear, and it fades away, fades, 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 and finally disappears. It's a curious world, this, isn't it? Because you hear all the realities in it, the sounds, suddenly coming out of nothing. You don't see any reason for them to begin, they just appear, and then they echo away through the corridors of the mind, which we call memory. Now, if you open your eyes, it's a little harder to see this with your eyes because unlike sounds, the eyes sound static. Or rather, they look static. Everything looks still to your eyes. But you must understand that the world you are looking at, say when you look at a light, that light is vibrating. All material things are vibrations and they are vibrating at you now in the same way as the sound was vibrating on your ears. In other words, the present world that you see is a vibration coming just as the sound comes out of silence. The light is coming out of space it's coming out of nothing straight at you now and echoing away into the past. So the course of time is really very much like the course of a ship in the ocean. Because here's the ship, you see, and it leaves behind it a wake. And the wake fades out and that tells us where the ship has been in just the same way as the past and our memory of the past tells us what we have done. But as we go back into the past and we go back and back 
to prehistory and we use all kinds of instruments and scientific methods for detecting what happened, we eventually reach a point where all record of the past fades away in just the same way as the wake of the ship. Now the important thing to remember in this illustration is that the wake doesn't drive the ship any more than the tail wags the dog. Supposing there's a neurotic, difficult child, and uh, one school of thought used to say, well, bang him about, beat him up, and uh, maybe he'll change. But then they said, oh no, that's not fair to the child to beat him up because it was his parents. Uh, they didn't bring him up properly. And so then they say, well, punish the parents. Well, the parents say, excuse me, but I'm, our parents were neurotic too, and they brought us up badly, so we couldn't help what we did. And so since the grandparents are dead, we can't get at them. And in any case, supposing we could, uh, we would pass the whole blame back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And they say, they started all this mess. But then Eve would say, no, uh, the serpent tempted me and I did eat, and it was the serpent's fault. Well, you know, when God, uh, in the story of Genesis, asked Eve, uh, didst thou eat the fruit of the tree whereof I told thee thou shouldst not eat? She said, oh, but the serpent tempted me and I did eat. And God looked at the serpent and the serpent didn't make any excuse. He probably winked. Because the serpent, being an angel, was wise enough to know where the present begins. So you see, if you insist on being moved, being determined by the past, that's your game. But the fact of the matter is, it all starts right now. But we like to establish a connectivity with the past. Because that gives other people the impression that we're sane. If you ask me then, why am I talking? Well, I could say I'm making a living this way. Or I have a message that I want to get across to you. But that's not the reason. I'm talking for the same reason that birds sing and for the same reason that the stars shine. Is I, I, I dig it. Why do you dig it? Well, I could go on answering all sorts of questions about human motivation and psychology, but they wouldn't explain a thing because explaining things by the past is really a refusal to explain them at all. All you're doing is postponing the explanation. You're putting it back and back and back and back and that explains nothing. What does explain things is the present. Why do you do it now? Now, this is a slight cheat because that doesn't explain it either. Because what happens now, just as the sound comes out of silence, all this comes out of nowhere. This is in connection with what I explained to you in another talk about the power of nothingness. All life suddenly emerges out of space, bang, right now. And to ask again, why does it happen, is an unprofitable question. Because the interesting thing is not why, but what. What happens, not why does it happen. I can say, well, I am doing this now because I did that then. And so I am producing for you a continuous line of thought. But actually I'm doing it backwards. I'm doing it always from now and connecting up what I do now with what I did so that you can see a consistent story. If I define myself as the whole field of events, we'll say the organism environment field, which is the real me, then all the things that happen to me may be called my doing. And that is the real sense of karma. But when we speak about freedom from karma, freedom from being the puppet of the past, that simply involves a change in your thinking. It involves, in other words, you're getting rid of the habit of thought whereby you define yourself as the result of what has gone before and instead get into the more plausible and more reasonable habit of thought, in terms of which you don't define yourself in terms of what you've done before, but in terms of what you're doing now. 
and that is liberation from the ridiculous situation of being a dog wagged by its tail. Tonight I want to tell you three fantasies, all of which have something in common. The first fantasy about is about reproduction. We use the word reproduction in two principal ways. When we talk about the biological reproduction of the species, and when we talk about making a good reproduction of something in terms of a painting, a photograph, or a recording, or a videotape. And what is all this about reproduction in that direction? Hundreds of years ago, kings of Europe who wanted to form feudal alliances by marrying the princesses of far-off states would have painters send portraits of the lady in question to see if His Majesty approved of her before he got her. And there's a famous story in which Henry VIII of England was badly cheated in this respect by a too flattering portrait of Anne of Cleves. And therefore there grew up a kind of uh, morale among artists in the European tradition to make faithful reproductions of people. And they perfected their technique, beginning with the marvelous work of the Renaissance painters and the Flemish painters, and going on finally to what was called art officiel in the 19th century. We got what we now call photographic realism. But then they said, isn't there some more scientific way of doing this? And so they discovered the camera. And first of all, there were, you know, remember those brownish daguerreotypes? And people said, well, that is pretty. It really looks like Grandpa, doesn't it? And then they said, but uh, some things, uh, there are several things missing. It isn't colored. So first of all, they tinted them. And then they said, well, it's real lifelike. But then they went on to say, but you know, there are some people whose whole style of life, whose personality is in the way they move. And if you just take a static shot like that, the personality isn't there. It's the way they go. So they said, we've got to have some way of making people move. So they invented the movies. And I remember when the first movies came out, they were all going everybody was going, you know, in a jerky way. Then they smoothed it out and they said, oh, that's real lifelike. But they said then, but here's another thing about reproducing people, which is that um, they talk and a whole lot of their personality is in the voice. So can't we have them talking at the same time that they move? So they invented the talkies. And then to get it more lifelike still, they colored them. They said, wow, now we're really getting somewhere. Then, uh, to make it even more real, they put it in 3D. And you had to wear sort of spectacles over your face to see it that way. But then they went on to say, why is it that every time we want to see one of these things, we have to go down uh, to the center of town? Can't we have it all at home? And so television came on. And in television, they first of all started out with black and white, and it was kind of uh, like Robert Benchley once described the cuts in French newspapers as all looking as if they'd been made on bread. Well, that was television in a certain period. And then they improved it, and then they colored it, and that's where we are now. Not quite. Because somebody has come out with the thing that we shall all be seeing soon, which is the hologram. A television image produced by laser beams where you see a three-dimensional figure out in the air in front of you. I say, isn't that marvelous? Whew. And then, uh, but of course, when you go up to it and you put your hand on it, your hand goes right through it. You can't touch it. And you see, that was always the trouble with television. 
because you look at whatever you're seeing behind a screen. It's intangible, it doesn't smell, and it won't relate to you. So these are further problems to be solved in the techniques of electronic reproduction, and they'll do it. They'll first of all manage a way in which the electronic emission sources can solidify and make the air vibrate so that you go up and you'll touch the figure and you won't be able to push your hand through it because the air will be going faster than your hand. Imagine that. You can actually, if there's a beautiful dancer on the television, you'll be able to go up and embrace her. But she won't know you're there. And she won't respond to you. And you'll say, well, that's not very lifelike. Just as they once said, uh, if the photograph doesn't move, it's not very lifelike. If it doesn't talk, it's not very lifelike. They'll next say, if the reproduction in three dimensions solid doesn't respond, it's not very lifelike. So they'll have to figure out a technique for doing that. What will they do? Well, I tell you, sitting in your home, where you're watching the scene on a kind of stage now, not on a screen, there'll be a TV camera observing you. And that TV camera will report back everything you do into a computer. And the computer will so manage each bit of information, that's to say, each tiny little um, granule unit of information going into the image that you're looking at, that it will immediately decide what is the appropriate response to the approach that you are making to the image. Won't that be crazy? You know, she may slap you in the face, and she may kiss you. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> but then, to say, now, this is still not really the kind of reproduction we want. What we wanted when we looked at this scene is to be able to identify with one of the characters. We wanted to not just watch the drama that's being performed on the stage in front of us, but actually get into it. And so we want to be wired in with electro, um, electrodes on the brain so that we will actually feel the emotions of the people acting on the stage. And so eventually we will get absolutely perfect reproduction and we will be able to see that image so vividly that we shall become it. And so the question arises, could that be where we are already? Are we a reproduction which over the centuries of evolution has worked out to be a replica of something else that was going on and we are where we always were? Now the next fantasy concerns the idea that every living being thinks it's human. And that means a plant, a worm, a virus, a bacterium, a fruit fly, a hippopotamus, a giraffe, a rabbit. That all these beings, wherever they feel out from, as we feel out from our bodies, feel that they're in the middle. That is to say, wherever you look, you turn your head around, and you feel you're in the middle of the world. You feel you're, you're the center. And a rabbit or a fruit fly feels that it is a center. And it has around it a company of associates who look like it. And therefore, this creature knows that these are the right people, just as we know when we look at human beings. Uh, they're the right people. They are one of us. Only, of course, we have to make distinctions because you never really know uh, that you are you and that you are really in the right place unless you can contrast yourself with some other people who are, after all, not quite in the right place and some other people who are very much in the wrong place. <laughs> and then, through having this succession of comparisons, you know that you're okay. Well, the insect has exactly the same arrangement. Well, you say, well, insects and, and things like fishes, uh, they don't have any culture. What do you mean, fishes being civilized and being entitled to consider themselves as humans? 
Well, let me put the argument from the fish's point of view. <laughs> Fishes say, human beings are a mess. Look what they do. They, they can't exist without cluttering themselves and carrying around all kinds of things outside their bodies. They have to have houses and automobiles and books, books and records and television and hi-fi equipment and stuff, endless stuff and they litter the earth with rubbish. So think of a dolphin. He isn't really a fish because a dolphin's a mammal, but a dolphin's point of view towards the human race. Dolphins spend most of their time playing. They don't work because the grocery is right there in the ocean, whatever they need. And so a dolphin will uh, catch up with a seagoing liner and it'll get on the wake of the liner and put its tail at an exact angle of 26 degrees. And in so doing, the liner will carry the dolphin along. The dolphin will make circles around the liner just for fun, playing all its life in the water. And uh, we know that a dolphin's brain is as big, if not bigger than ours. It is incredibly intelligent, but it has a language which we can't decipher. And the person who knows most about dolphins in the United States, Dr. John Lilly, is a friend of mine, and he said he came to the conclusion that dolphins were too smart to tell us their language. So he abandoned this project. He said he would no longer keep such a highly civilized being in the concentration camp of the zoo and that it should go back to the ocean. So the point is that every, not only dolphins, but every organism that has any sensitivity in it whatsoever considers itself to be the center of the universe. Now it has its problems. There's a Zen poem which says, the morning glory which blooms for an hour differs not at heart from a giant pine that lives for a thousand years. In other words, an hour is a long life to a morning glory. A thousand years is a long life to a pine. And our four score years and ten, or as the insurance company's actuarial tables put it, somewhere between 65 and 70 years as an average human life, seems about the right length of life. I mean, there are people who want to go on and on and uh, are in quest of immortality and have their bodies frozen in case there should develop in the future some technique by which they could be revived. But I, I really don't go for that idea because nature has mercifully arranged the principle of forgettery as well as the principle of memory. If you always and always and always remembered everything, you see, you would be like a piece of paper which had been painted over and painted over and painted over until there was no space left and you wouldn't be able to distinguish between one thing and another. It's like when a whole bunch of people start to scream and make noises and out scream each other and soon you can hear nobody. So in that way one's memories become screams and nature mercifully arranges that the whole thing be erased and you begin again. You see, it doesn't matter in what form you begin, whether you begin again as a human being or as a fruit fly butterfly or a beetle or a bird it, it feels the same way that you feel now so we're really all in the same place we all have above us things much higher than ourselves and we all have below us things that we feel are much lower than ourselves just as there are things out there on the left and things out there on the right and things in front and things behind because you're the middle you're the middle everywhere, always. Now my third fantasy. Nobody has, it seems to me, really seriously asked the question, how do stars begin? Why, how out of space do these enormous radioactive centers arise? Well, 
I'm going to solve this problem on the principle of the egg and the hen. Because it is said, a chicken is one egg's way of becoming other eggs. And if you've understood my second fantasy, you will see how that could be true. Now let's suppose then that a planet is one star's way of becoming another star. You know, stars, when they explode, they send a lot of uh, goo out into space. And some of this goo solidifies into balls which get in orbit and spin around the star. And in one chance in a thousand, maybe, one of those balls will become like the planet Earth. And slowly upon it will arise what some people might call a disease called the bacteria of intelligent life. And they have a notion, these things that we call a lie, that they ought to go on. And, you know, they have a fixed idea in their heads that they should keep on doing whatever it is they're doing. And they should always be doing it better. So they divide themselves into different species. And these species compete with each other in order to, uh, as it were, flex their muscles and get better and better at whatever it is they are. And they go on doing this until one species really establishes itself as top species in the particular area on the particular planet. As we, human beings, homo sapiens, have established ourselves as top species on Earth, whatever top means. Well then, when we have a little leisure and don't have to spend all our time uh, finding food to put into our mouths, we start asking questions. And we look around at each other and everything and say, what is this? I mean, what's going on here? Well, some people say, that's a stupid question to ask. Why don't you just go on doing your work? Go hunting, go farming, go doing your business. They say, no, there are higher things. And so they create a special class of people who are in India called Brahmins. Among us, philosophers, scientists, theologians, thinkers. And they go into this question, and they're allowed uh, to stop farming, to stop hunting, to stop mining, to stop uh, scrubbing floors, and to go to very special places called universities, where they can sit around and think about what is going on. Now they think about this. First of all, they do what they call philosophy, which is they try to say, um, what it means, with, what, what does the word be, what does the word exist mean? What do we mean when we say we're here? Well, they find they can't discuss that very far. Because um, the word stops meaning anything. It sort of becomes a noise. They say, now, we're not really getting to the point. What we've got to do is instead of thinking all the time, and just theorizing and talking words about what's going on, we've got to investigate it experimentally. We've somehow got to look into this stuff that we call reality, the material world, and find out what it is. So they start chopping it up. See? They go into flowers and they chop up the seeds and they look into the middle of the seeds. They find something there and then they have to get a magnifying glass and look in on that and get smaller and smaller and smaller. They, they reason they must eventually come to some particle called an atom. In Greek, atom means atomos, non-cuttable, what you can't split any further. So they come down to the atomos, that than which there is no witcher, they thought. But then they found they could split that atom. They could find the electron, the positron, the meson, etc., 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 forever. And so uh, they said, well, this is, I mean, this is uh, real science because uh, we, we, we've now found out uh, that every atomos of matter contains immense energy and that we could come to the point where we could release the energy in the air. And the trouble with intellectual people is that anything that can be done must be done. And so eventually, in the necessary course of the development of nature, they found out 
how to blow the earth to pieces and turn it into a star. So, uh, that may be, you see, how stars originate. They have planets, like uh, chickens have eggs, and the eggs burst and turn into chickens. And planets burst through the agency of intelligent life and turn into stars, which throw out other mud balls, which are, some of which stand a reasonable chance, about as reasonable a chance to say any male spermatozoan stands when it enters the female womb of becoming a baby. One in a million. And those spermatozoa are in exactly the same position as the planets and the stars. Now I tell you, this is a fantasy. But you may ask me, isn't it a rather unpleasant fantasy? Aren't things going the wrong way, the wrong direction? In other words, if um, the whole point of life, I mean, this tender biological substance with all its tubes and filaments and nerves, which is so very sensitive, if all this is to end up in fire, into an absolute blaze of light, don't we say, oh, what a shame. You don't, is that the way it ends? <sighs> but so many people say that they want to see the light. They want to be enlightened. They want to dissolve into the light of God. And then when they've done that, all over again, the process goes on blows out those mud balls and here are planets and here once again you're a baby you're a child the flowers are brilliantly colored the stars are gorgeous the smell of the earth the sound of the rain everything is marvelous once again and once again you see the other the man, the woman that you love. As if it had never happened before, it all starts over. And as it goes on, it gets more and more intense. All the problems get more and more problematic. And you find you're wrestling with something you can't control. You've got to control it, but you absolutely can't control it. Like all the problems of the world at the present time, it, the, the whole scene is completely out of hand. And we feel we're going to our doom because we're going once again towards the birth of a star, which is the most creative thing there is. Now, if you think about this for a while, you see, well, I've put forward three fantasies, all of which have a cyclic quality. We reproduce, not only biologically, but we reproduce artistic, technical. So, uh, just for a moment, I want to put in an aside about biological. See, when I think back to my grandfather, whom I knew fairly well, he was, uh, when I was a little boy, he was something extraordinarily impressive. He looked like King Edward VII. He was a very, very elegant man. With a little goatee beard. He didn't have sideburns like this. And he had shorter hair. Very elegant. Very beautiful. And I thought, you know, he was the very image of God. And now here I am. The same age as he was when I first knew him. And I have five grandchildren. And I saw them. <laughs> no longer impressed by grandfathers. <laughs> I know. Here I am. I'm one of them too. And this is the same idea, you see, of the round. That we are almost uh, perpetually in the same place as the French proverb says, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more it changes, the more it's the same thing. 
Well, that means then, you see, that existence, the feeling of being, is a sort of spectrum. Just as light is at one end red and at the other end violet. And you have to have these extremes in order to have color at all, in order to know light. So you see, uh, likewise, we, we have to have the experience that there is somebody else, something else going on altogether out of our control in order to have the experience of being me. And so in order to feel good, to feel that um, well, life is worthwhile, that existence is, is worth going on, in order to bring out that feeling, just as the red brings out the violet, there has to be in the back of our minds, maybe very far away, the comprehension that there is something that could happen, that absolutely mustn't happen, that is the horrors, that is the screaming memes at the end of the line. We have to know that's there. And every so often, that has to happen. Because if there isn't the experience that we go through called the screaming memes at the end of the line, where everything has gone wrong, like uh, just before he died, the British novelist Arnold Bennett said, I feel somehow that everything's absolutely wrong. You know? So the, 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 the possibility, even the, the imagination that there could be such an experience in the back of our heads, is the background which gives intensity to the sense that we call feeling good feeling that it's it's all right it's all right now I'm all right now. so if you understand that you see that really and truly you're always in the same place just as every creature thinks it's a human being and as just every being turns out to be a reproduction by some interesting technology, whether it's electronic or biological, makes very little difference. And just as it may be, I don't know, planets are stars' ways of becoming other stars, and so on, and so on, and so on. But the moral is, you're always in the same place. And what is that place? You can ask yourself very, very, I won't say seriously, because this isn't really serious, it's sincere. Ask yourself very sincerely, if that is so, if in other words, the place in which you are now is the place where everything and everybody else really is, only there's an arrangement to pretend that you ought to be somewhere else. <laughs> So the place where you are is the place where you're always pretending you ought to be somewhere else. And this is the nature of life. This is the pulse. I ought to be somewhere else. So it's a kind of a, a gazoom like that, see? When if you discover that that's the trick that you're playing on yourself, you become serene. And you uh, don't entirely give up the game because uh, you've seen through it. But you say, hmm, it really might be fun to go on playing. <laughs>